Yeah, <coughs> thank you. Um, so for the last talk of this session, I want to talk about uh, microbially induced sedimentary structures. So these are a thing that have become, well, towards the last half of the 20th century, the last decade of the 20th century, people started to recognise that there were certain features that were microbially induced sedimentary structures. In the broadest sense of the term, that includes everything from algal induced sedimentary structures through to microbially mass induced sedimentary structures through to uh, kind of soil crusts and so on. And in 2001, Nora Nofke et al. defined the term microbially induced sedimentary structures as a subset of physical sedimentary structures. And uh, in the rock record, these things, have these things have started to be identified increasingly from the morphology. The, the, the fact that people now realise that you can get microbial uh, inducing of sedimentary structures suggests that there might be uh, an explanation for multiple irregularities on the surface of beds that were previously largely ascribed to being uh, physical. Um, and as this has taken off in the last 10, 20 years or so, uh, a number of things have been said about wrinkle structures and microbially induced sedimentary structures. Most commonly that they are uh, largely Precambrian features. They, just, they, they diminish in their uh, abundance during the Phanerozoic and that they're all largely marine fossils. And the impetus for this talk is that myself and my co-authors have seen features such as these in a number of different uh, successions, which quite patently aren't all uh, Precambrian. They're all over the place, and they're not all uh, shallow marine. They've got quite a large spread. So what I want to do in this talk is to start off by trying to dismiss a number of these mis misconceptions about the distribution of the rock record. And then, uh, in the second part of the talk, talk about the fact that there are big problems with the, with the, with the term miss in the first place. But the fact that there are similarities between microbially induced sedimentary structures and purely agartic sedimentary structures means that uh, we're, uh, we're kind of uh, getting ourselves into trouble by referring to these things as miss. And finally, I want to offer a solution for that. So these histograms are basically, there were, it turns out there have been 99 publications that cite Nofka's original uh, definition of miss and use the term miss. And this is the distribution of uh, those, uh, you know, the, the, the stratigraphic and environmental distribution of those in the rock record. And you can see that actually, although there seems to be a, 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 a large abundance of them in the kind of neoproterozoic Cambrian, they're spread throughout the entire geological record. If we look at the Precambrian, Phanerozoic, and modern kind of distribution of these features, they're also uh, pan environmental. They go from deep marine fasces through to non marine fasces, which dispels the myth that these are all entirely cyanobacterial. And if we, do, if we just look at the balance between Precambrian and Phanerozoic examples, we can see there are actually more Phanerozoic examples than Precambrian examples. So if we want to know why people are claiming these are more abundant in the Precambrian than the Phanerozoic, it's useful to look at how these things have been described in the first place. And if you look at the number of instances of papers that describe myths incidentally, that is, those papers where they're looking at a different paleontological aspect or sedimentological aspect of a succession, most of the, uh, the Phanerozoic is represented by that. People will find Carboniferous ones and say, oh, there's some myths next to a ripple, or here's some myths in the Jurassic in the same location as a lateral accretion set. In these instances, they're treated as sedimentary structures. But for all of the Precambrian and for all of the Triassic, these things are given special exception. So people only publish on these if they, if they can tie them into uh, extinction events or the evolution of, of life, or the oldest example of microbes on the planet. And that's also revealed by this kind of inverse relationship with the impact factor of where these things are published. If you look at the impact factor for Triassic ones or pre ones, it's way higher than the rest. But these, so it looks like it's a visibility issue, right? It looks like people, have, if you want to find, if you want to paper in nature, find some Triassic mist, right? But if you find Permian mist, that's not getting into nature, okay? So you've got to, you know, this, this visibility issue has, has led to this mist myth. Um, so, right, so that's, that's one thing. And uh, so if we accept that myths are, are pretty common, we then have to try and look at how they're described. So there are multiple different names for myths in the literature. So Nofka came up with myths, then Ericsson, I think it was a pun, came up with microbially related structures as misses. And then Galing and Droza came up with TOS for textured organic structures. And, and there's a variety of different names that have been applied to these features. And it's fair enough because these features are quite hard to define uh, in terms of shape. And one of the most common terms used is elephant skin textures. And in the, so in the far right there, you can see something that approached the original definition of elephant skin textures. These were features that looked, <laughs> reticulate fabrics that looked like elephant skin. 
But if you look at what, what is now being referred to elephant skin throughout the literature and on Wikipedia, these are elephants in serious needs of dermatologists, right? <laughs> it's, it just, it's just a bucket term for anything at the moment. And the same goes for wrinkle structures. And this and wrinkle structures is a particularly annoying use of uh, myths. So here is, here's an example of wrinkle structures from the Severn Estuary described by John Allen in 1985. They're formed because small layers of sand get deposited as tidal couplets and they load down into the underlying mud and they create this kind of wrinkled fabric. In 1997, Hagedorn and Botcher published a paper where they noted that wrinkle structures could be formed by microbial processes on microbial maps. But in their paper, they kind of short sell people like Allen and they say, but Allen invoked purely physical processes. He didn't consider the fact there was microbial binding. Well, he did. He published a paper looking at these things, showing that these were forming on sand and mud. There was no microbial involvement at all. And then later on, so that, that kind of got thrown out the window, and then later it becomes uh, that the MIS community want to use wrinkle structure only if you can Im invoke a kind of microbial, uh, a microbial origin. So that means if you come across features like this in the rock record, unless you can invoke a microbial origin, you can't call those wrinkles You've got to come up with a different name for them, even though they quite patently are wrinkles in the sediment. And then more recently, it's, it's come around this kind of myth, myth that actually all uh, wrinkles in the rock record are created by microbes. Well, these ones aren't. These wrinkles are created by melted ice. These ones are created by raindrop imprints. And these ones are created by as hedon ripples. Right? And you can argue whether or not these will enter the rock record. And I'll tell you, I'll try and say later on that I think they probably can get into the rock record. But it means that this, this idea of wrinkle structures, this name, is not appropriate. You can't just hijack a sedimentological term and demand that it has to have a microbial origin. And the same goes for kinea. Okay, so kinea is a relatively common feature. So the top right there is the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, my top. Yeah, top right is uh, the picture from the treatise. Uh, and this, that's also Walcott's original description. So when Walcott found these things, he described these things and thought they were some kind of algal feature. You can find them. They're relatively common. You can see them in Cambrian turbidites or division shelf sands. So, uh, Silurian tidal fasces, and multiple different uh, things have been, uh, mechanisms have been proposed for their origin. They're these unusually kind of uh, steep limbed small ripples. They're a little bit weird because they seem to be on a, a dimension that they are too small to form by purely physical processes. And recently there's been a few papers that have discussed how these things can form. So uh, an experimental paper trying to uh, induce different uh, instabilities because you've got water flowing through the mat and flowing above the mat, and then you can create these kinea features. Another paper recently in Nature Geoscience saying that different aggregates of microbial mat could pluck up bits of sediment and create this effectively as an erosional feature. And that's great. But this, let's go back to this original picture of kinea uh, from the treatise and from Walcott. Uh, Matt Stimson and uh, Randy Miller in New Brunswick recently uh, requested from the Smithsonian the original type specimen of Kinea of Walcott's, uh, uh, from Walcott's paper, and this is it. And the Kinea isn't on the surface of a bed. That's just a badly cropped picture, okay? So Kinea doesn't even exist. It's on two sides of a clasp that Walcott picked up that have been dissolved. You know, it's, uh, it's just dissolution of limestone in the carbonate clasp. So all this kind of, there's a lot of people talking about Kinea, but it's not even a thing. And also, <laughs> also, it doesn't just occur in the past, as people have claimed in the past. Here's some adhesion ripples which match the description of Kinea forming in uh, Hokum in Norfolk. And if you zoom in, you can see the adhesion is being produced by water tension and not by microbes. Right. So basically, the similarity of form is not proof of a scientific proof of a common origin. And if we're looking at things in the rock record, we've got to address that. So a couple of uh, other points about this. Uh, I don't want to be too negative of a talk. But this is a multi-directed ripple marks are another thing that have been claimed to be missed. It's been suggested that, and it's been noted as well. So if you go to uh, the German bite, people have noticed that microbial mats can stabilize certain ripple horizons and you'll get mul multiple directed ripples because uh, you've got successive generations of ripple formation in different directions and some have been stabilized by mats. Uh, but that doesn't account for all of them, right? And here are some multiple directed ripple marks forming on a beach where there's no microbes involved. It's just the general drainage of these puddles as they go out, and then you get different shapes of drainage puddles, and the ripples are in different directions. Yeah? So things like this, you don't have to invoke a microbial origin. They can be abiotic. This preservation issue is something that comes up a lot. A, it's commonly cited that how would you get features in the rock record if you didn't have microbial mats preserving or, or stabilizing the substrate? Wouldn't they get eroded by the sediment that goes over the top? 
Well, no, they wouldn't, because that's not how sedimentation works. All you need to preserve the surface of a bed is a change in the hydrodynamic conditions such that you can deposit sediment, but you can't erode what was there before. So this idea that these things like settles, which is the, uh, an Australian term, it's basically flutes backwards. So they're these inverted features you see on beaches where you've got uh, wind erosion of sand. Um, there have been papers that suggest that these are only known in the Precambrian, only known in the Cambrian and the Modern, and therefore they must have been map projected. And then when maps disappeared in the Ordovician, they, they, weren't, they don't appear in the record anymore. So here are some from the Silurian. Okay? And also this idea of preservation, it doesn't just go for sedimentary structures, because if you look at MIS, if you go and you see these things forming, uh, you can see these kind of synoresis track type features in a microbial mat in Norfolk, and there it is zoomed in, and you can see these gas bubbles. Um, when you look at them a few hours later, when you just add water, they kind of heal up. So there are, there's issues with getting microbial features into the rock record as much as there are getting abiotic features into the rock record. You know, just having a magic glue over the top doesn't solve all your problems. So how do we identify these things visually? Well, we can, you can take thin sections. You can look at these things through SEM. You can look for associated geochemical signatures. There are microbial map features in the rock record. And this, uh, this is a thin section of this area here. But in reality, most of the time, you might not be looking for that. And you might not want to spend loads of money on SEM time having found a carboniferous succession with loads of these features inside. So you need to find, we need to have a way of describing them. And another reason we need to have a way of describing them uh, and visually classifying them is that increasingly people have started uh, looking for these things uh, on Mars and on other planets. And, you know, these are pictures, this, this paper came out this year. None of these features particularly look like microbial features. There's plenty of reasons you can have for these being uh, uh, just modern erosion and weathering features of, of rocks. And, uh, and basically, yeah, if you're looking for microbial maps on Mars, you might as well also look for the lizards and the flowers and the mice <laughs> and the pyramids <laughs> and the yetis, right? So it's not the, uh... So miss isn't working, right? And what we know is that if we, what we can solve it, we can class them as a, a subset of sedimentary surface textures. We know we can have abiotic things that create patterns on bedding surfaces. We know we can have microbial processes that create them. And when we find them in the rock record, they can be problematic because we might not have all the information necessary to diagnose them one way or another. So, this is the way that I propose, we, we, or my co-authors we propose that we deal with this. Here's a microbial mat up in the uh, Canadian Arctic. And what you can see is that there's areas where there's mat and there's areas where there isn't mat because the mat's been ripped up. And it's the physical processes acting on that sediment, whether or not a mat is present, that, chain, that, that leave behind different signatures. So there's a two footprints arrowed. And the one on the uh, right over there shows, the, uh, shows a footprint where there's no mat, where the mat's been ripped up. And it's got quite a sharp impression. Towards the left, the, mat has left, uh, the footprint's left an impression, but it's rebounded with the elasticity of the mat. And so if we consider these sedimentary surface textures as being on surfaces which have mat and which, haven't, which don't have mats, and that's been the case since the Archean to the present day, it's the physical processes that operate through those onto that medium that are more important. So it's adhesion which might, uh, through you know, algal baffling lead these reticular structures, or through uh, water tension create adhesion warts, or shear might create different types of structures. Or gas and air escape can create different structures. So you can have oxygenated mat uh, oxygen production in the mat creating in bubbles, or in a tidal environment, you might have the water, the groundwater prism rising at a different weight to the incoming tide, and you get bubbles inside the sand. Okay? And there are multiple different physical processes that will operate on a substrate, whether or not a mat is present. So we suggest this is the solution. Especially for you, if you're out in the field for the first time looking at a mat, coming across a structure, and you don't know how to classify it. Call it a sedimentary surface structure and just accept this. Bring these things back into the fold of geological agnosticism. Okay? But you can't be certain all the time. There can be abiotic ones, there are biotic ones, and in between there's a gradation of uncertainty. And if we apply this in the rock record, it makes things, it means that it doesn't make things less interesting. Here's an example from the uh, Carboniferous in a a kind of stagnant, um, abandoned channel deposit. We've got all these little, what look like they could be bubbles. They might be classed as mists if they were found in the Ediacara, and I don't know what they'd be classed as. But if, we, uh, if you look at them in more detail, you find they're very close to Chordates fronds and uh, plant debris. And we can probably suggest that these might be drip impressions. Interesting in themselves, because you need, things to, you need trees for drips to fall off before you get drips in the rock record, but they're not microbial. So we might class these as category A sedimentary surface textures. This one, we can see a drag mark of something which appears to have bent ripples inwards, and that wouldn't happen without any cohesion. So we can say it's probably going to be biotic, but we haven't got any accessory information to, to prove that. 
And then other ones like this, these wrinkle marks from the bead formation. Uh, these things, if you look uh, at, at beds surrounding them, there's undicular going through, undicular fish traces going through that, that bead uh, rock there, and it's left little levees behind. So it looks like it has been going through some kind of sludge, because where you don't see those wrinkle marks, the undicular doesn't have these levees. Okay? So again, we might call this BA. And this is, I mean, it's just something to, to speculate with. There are certain instances as well. You might find a, uh, a bedding surface that looks like that, and you, know, you don't have the time or effort to go through and see what it really is, so just class it as AB and leave it for someone else in the future. These aren't kind of like, uh, these aren't things stuck in, uh, set in stone. These are just, it's just a, a practical way of dealing with these things. So just in, to conclude, miss and mislike features have got a pan-environmental and continuous record since the Archean. They are not more common in the early Triassic and they are not more common before the Cambrian. Okay? In the rock record, many myths are actually problematically induced sedimentary structures, but people like their acronyms too much to let them have finish. <laughs> we suggest the term sedimentary surface textures to avoid overinterpretation, sensationalism, and uh, appropriate descriptions in the field. Okay, thank you.